Hello everyone, in this video we will be taking up the remaining questions of GATE 2019 Food Technology section. Welcome to Foodemi. So we will start with question number 11. It states match the, match the laws with corresponding phenomenon. The laws are being given in the column 1 and the column 2 gives the phenomenon which are being governed by these laws. The following are the laws, Newton's law, Hertz contact, stress theory, Fick's law and Bond's law. The following phenomenon given here are size reduction, substance cooling, damage of fruits and vegetables and molecular diffusion. So these laws are, being gov are governing one of these phenomena. Let's study these laws one by one. First is the Newton's law. Newton law gave the law of cooling, of substance cooling, that it, it talks about the change in the temperature of a substance. It states that the rate of the change of temperature change of a body is directly proportional to the difference of the temperature between the body and the surrounding. That is, if the body, what, what will be the heat transfer rate if the body is having different temperature than the surrounding? So, the rate of the change of the temperature is directly proportional to the temperature difference between the body and the surrounding or we can say that the heat transfer, the heat loss is directly proportional to the temperature difference between the body and the surrounding. So, this will give you the law and this is the constant, uh, proportionality constant. So, Newton's law gives the substance cooling, law for the substance cooling. Next is the Hertz contact stress theory. Hertz, Hertz basically proposed a theory called as Hertz contact stress theory which talks about the two bodies which are elastic and isotropic when they are in contact with each other. So what will be the impact of that contact of that what will be the stress on the both and what will be the deformation caused because of this contact stress. So this is this phenomenon is basically used in the fruits and vegetables because of their contact what damage can be there what damage can be done on them. So this law talks this law can be used in the damage of fruits and vegetables. Let, let's look at this law. It talks about, I told you, it talks about the contacts area, the deformation that is caused and what is the stress is there between the two contact surfaces. So it is a contact, it talks about the contact stress between two elastic bodies. So the maximum contact stress is given by 3 by 2 F pi upon pi AB. A and B are the, uh, are the major and minor semi excesses of the elliptical bodies and F is the force that is being there. Next is the fixed law. So, Fix gave the law for diffusion. It talks about the diffusion whenever there is a change or the diffusion of the mass from one side to the other side of the concentration. So, Fix law, Fix law talks about the diffu molecular diffusion. It states that the rate of the diffusion is directly proportional to the surface area, one. Second, it is directly proportional to the differences in the concentration. And next, it is inversely proportional to the thickness of the membrane through which the diffusion is taking place. So, the higher the concentration difference, the rate of the diffusion will be higher. The higher the surface area we have for the diffusion, the higher will be the surface, higher will be the rate of the diffusion. And the more the thicker is the membrane, the lower will be the rate of diffusion. It is also expressed in terms of flux. This is given by this equation that flux is directly proportional to the concentration gradient or the concentration difference. So, dc by dx is talking about the concentration gradient. This is the proportionality constant which is also called as diffusivity constant. J is your flux. So, flux can be find out through this. Diffusion flux can be find out using this fixed law. Last law is the bond law. Bond's law talks about the size reduction processes. Whenever a large compound has been broken down to smaller compounds, what work is required to do that? So, the Bond's law talks about the work required to break a large particle into the smaller particles. For the size reduction, we use this process. We use this law. It, it is, it law states that the work required is directly proportional to the square root of surface to volume ratio of the substance. So, this is the answer. We have got the answer here. P is for Two, that is Newton's law for cooling and Hertz law for the for the damage of the fruits and the vegetables. Fick's law is for the diffusion. Four and the Bond's law is for the size reduction. So this is answer number A. We have got the answer now. Now we'll look at question number twelve. Match the mold with its asexual or sexual spores. In the column one, we have different genus of molds. In the column two, we have the name of the spores which are being produced by these molds. The different moles given here are Aspergillus, Geotrichum, Rhizopus and Umycetes. The moles given here are the spores, sorry, the spores given here are Athrospores, Oospores, Conidia, Sporangiospores. So the moles and the spores, these two we have to match here. First of all, let's, let's talk about moles and spores. We know that moles reproduce by producing spores. These spores are very much 
are very much resistant to the harsh environmental condition because of their structures and because of the covering they have whenever they find favorable condition they grow in those conditions so these this is the method by which the molds reproduce these spores can be asexual or sexual so let's talk about these molds which are given here first is the aspergillus aspergillus mold reproduce asexually and produce the spores called as conidia the spores are known as conidium in singular and conidia in plural these conidium are produced in a structure called as conidiophore this conidiophore is having the those spores inside it this aspergillus is also known as conidial fungi because it produces conidia as its spores in the structure conidiophore so aspergillus produces conidia as their spores next is geotrichum geotrichum is very different from aspergillus as it is not having any conidiophore or the structure bearing the conidium or the spores this actually produces the spore by fragmenting its hyphae so these hyphae are making the spores so these spores are having very much variable variant variation in the length and they are unicellular so there is no conidiophore and the spores are produced by fragmentation of hyphae and the spores are called as your uh, uh, atherospores so atherospore next is the rhizopus rhizopus is also known as the bread mold because it grows in the bread and rhizopus produces spore in a structure called as conidiophores sorry sporangiophores so the spores here are called as sporangia the structure is at the tip of the hyphae there is sporangiophore the structure which is having this sporangia the sporangium is known as the, uh, the structure looks like a sac the sporangiophore looks like a sac which is having all the spores of sporangia into it so the rhizospores produces sporangia sporangiospores or sporangios uh, uh, the next is the oomycetes oomycetes produce spores known as oospores and these can reproduce asexually as well as sexually it can opt for any so oomycetes oospores so uh, in the sporangia we get sporangiospores in the aspergillus conidium we get the conidia in the geotrichum we get atherospores and in the oomycetes we, we call it oospores so the answer is p3 q1 r4 s2 this is option number a let's move to question number 30 match the food given in the column 1 with the specific usage in the column 2 so in the column 1 we have different food in the column 2 are the products in which these foods can be utilized so let's look at them one by one first is the egg yolk egg yolk can be utilized out of this in the mayonnaise mayonnaise is nothing but it's simply a dressing which is an emulsion this is prepared by using oil and vinegar oil is being added drop by drop egg yolk is being added because of the main purpose as it has lecithin in it which acts as emulsifier which helps to stabilize the emulsion of this oil and water so that's why egg yolk is being used in this dressing so egg yolk is being used in mayonnaise next is the pre gelatinized starch pre gelatinized starch are those kind of starch which has already been pre gelatinized dried and then is being converted into powder form or any granular form so that it can be easily consumed in different products the pre gelatinized starch are being utilized in different foods such as soups in ready to eat fruit products and also in the baby foods the these products are very easy to use they are very convenient and can be easily cooked by simply adding water they reach a consistency of a normal cooked product so, uh, cooked product so that's why they are being used and also the main reason to use these in the baby foods are they are very easy to digest so pre gelatinized starch are being used in the baby foods next is the gums out of these products gums are being commonly used in the ice creams there their main role is they act as stabilizers for the ice cream the ice cream has this tendency to form larger ice crystals which deteriorates the quality because it disturbs the mouth feel of the ice cream the larger ice crystals are not being accepted by the consumer so therefore we add gums into the ice creams to stabilize the ice crystal size it basically controls or reduces the growth of the ice crystal size what is happening is that in an ice cream the smaller ice crystals because of the temperature fluctuation they melt and tend to move towards the large ice crystals this water accumulates near the large ice crystals and as the temperature again reaches to the freezing temperature they together make a larger molecule larger ice crystals that disturbs the quality or the consistency of the ice cream therefore these gums act there 
they play their role comes in there they increases the viscosity of this mix therefore whenever this temperature fluctuation is taken place the mobility of this diffusion of this ice crystal solution reduces and thereby there is a reduced rate of formation of larger ice crystals so the gums are used in the ice cream which act as a stabilizer there the last component or the last food is the starch starch is being added in the baking powder we know that the baking powder is used as an leveling as a, as a leveling agent in the various bakery products the baking powder is basically a composition of acid and base these components react in the presence of water to produce carbon dioxide this produced carbon dioxide is actually acting as a leveling agent in the product so we do not want this production of carbon dioxide by the addition of water prior to the addition in the food so to prevent this reaction between the acid and base prior to addition in the food we add starch into the baking powder this starch absorbs the moisture from the surrounding during the storage and the transportation so that this moisture do not come in the reaction with the acid and base in the baking powder therefore the starch is being used in baking powder the answer for this question is p2 q4 r1 and s Three. That is the option number A. Let's move to question number fourteen. Match the following bioactive compounds in the column one with the botanical sources in the column two. So in the column one we have the bioactive compounds, and the column two we have the sources from which we can extract these bioactive compounds. So the following bioactive compounds are isoflavones, resistant starch, xanthophyll, and resveratrol. The sources being given here are corn, grapes, soybean, plantain. Plantain is nothing but it's a culinary banana that is a, it belongs to the class of banana which can be used for cooking purpose. So let's start with this bioactive compounds. First is isoflavone. Isoflavone is the major flavonoid compound which are present in legumes and particularly in the soybean. So these isoflavones are present in soybean and other various other legumes also. These are basically have uh, belongs to the class of phytoestrogen. They possess this property of behaving like estrogen compounds. So these are plant derived compounds which have estrogen like activity. So isoflavone are very important compounds when it comes to this activity. So isoflavone comes from this the source is your soybean next is the resistant starch resistant starch are nothing but these are the starches which escape the digestion in the small intestine that is they go fermentation they undergo fermentation in the large intestine so they behave like the dietary fiber that we consume they are not like normal starches they escape the digestion portion so these are present in various food products and obviously they have a lot of health benefits the major food products which are in which they are present are like grains whole grains like oats barley in legumes also they are present and in plantain they are present plantain that i told you it's a culinary banana so they belong to the class of banana this is having a very high content of starch so this plantain is present in raw bananas also in the green banana where the starch is in the form of resistant starch this resistant starch can be converted to the normal starch by heating or baking process cooking process Next is the xanthophyll. Xanthophyll is basically belonging to the carotenoid family. It is a poly. It is a carotenoid family. It belongs to the carotenoid family. Uh, other compounds, which are other uh, bioactive compounds in the carotenoid family, can be your carotene and other others. So this xanthophyll is basically a color giving pigment which is present in various foods the main color given by this xanthophyll is the yellow and other hues can also be given like red and orange so the main products in which this xanthophyll is present are your corn pepper and other green leafy vegetables also there are various categories of xanthophyll again for example the main xanthophyll which is found in fruits uh, foods and uh, fruits and vegetable is the lutein this is found in green leafy vegetables others are also there like zeaxanthin cryptoxanthin etc last uh, so this uh, resistant starch belongs to your plantain xanthophyll belongs to your corn next is last is the resveratrol resveratrol is again basically a polyphenolic compound this the class of the polyphenolic compound to which this resveratrol compound belongs are called as still beans they are very specific compound of polyphenols these are having a high antimicrobial activity also and they are present naturally in some products and they are also produced in some products by in response to some injury or some stress so they are present naturally in various grapes and berries like in grapes berries blueberries mulberries all in all those skins are having this resveratrol compounds in them so also you will also notice that these are present in the red wine also so these are having a lot of positive health effect potential health effects all these compounds are having potential health effects so the resveratrol is present in the grapes so the correct answer for this match the following is p3 q4 r1 
and S2. That is option number B. Let's move to question number 15. Match the following question. Match the microbial species with the related disease caused by them. In the column 1, we have different microorganisms. In the column 2, we have the disease caused by different microorganisms. So, the microorganisms here are Vibrio species, Shigella species, E. coli, Salmonella typhi. The common diseases are gastroenteritis, typhoid, cholera, bacillus dysentery. These all diseases are caused by the pathogens mentioned here. Let's see which disease is caused by which microorganism. So, Vibrio species, the common disease causing Vibrio species is the Vibrio cholerae, which causes the disease cholera. In this case, Vibrio cholerae releases the cholera toxin into the body. That is basically a protein which causes a profuse diarrhea kind of condition in the body. And that causes watery diarrhea. The diarrhea or the common name for this is rice water stool. So, disease caused by Vibrio cholerae is cholera. Next is Shigella species. Shigella species, the common disease causing species from the Shigella genus is Shigella dysentery. Shigella dysentery is basically again causing a kind of dysentery in the body. This can be contaminated, this can be transmitted through the contaminated food and water and this causes the bacillus dysentery. The common name for this disease is also known as Shigellosis. This again consists of severe dysentery. And it can also include other symptoms like fever, abdominal pain, blood in the stool, mucus in the stools. So, these all diseases are being caused by Shigella dysentery. So, Shigella dysentery causes the bacillus dysentery disease. Next is E. coli. We know that this is Ishisha coli. This is again a gram-negative bacteria. This causes the common disease which is caused by E. coli that is by enterogenic E. coli is gastroenteritis. The, some all not all the species of E. coli are uh, harm, harmful. Some are harmless also, but some the common disease causing E. coli species cause gastroenteritis. This uh, diarrhea is also called as traveler's diarrhea. So E. coli causes gastroenteritis. Next is the Salmonella typhi. As the name suggests, the Salmonella typhi is causing the disease typhoid. There is another species of Salmonella that is Salmonella paratyphi that causes paratyphoid fever. The Salmonella causes the typhoid fever. This, the main source of Salmonella typhi is the human. The reservoir is a human and can be transmitted through contaminated food and water and also by, and food can also get contaminated through food handlers. So, the option becomes, so the answer for this becomes P3, Q4, R1 and S2. So, the correct option for this question is option number D of question 15. Now, let's move to question number 16. Buffalo milk having density of 1030 kg per meter cube is being homogenized with a pressure of 30 megapascal given acceleration due to gravity that is 9.81 meter per second and assuming no pressure loss, the velocity in meter per second of the milk flowing through the homogenizer wall will be dash. So here the milk is being homogenized and the density of the milk is given here is 1030 kg per meter cube. The pressure that is used for the homogenization is 30 megapascal that can be converted into pascal. Next is we have the acceleration to gravity and other thing mentioned here is there is no pressure loss. Now we have to find out the velocity at which the milk is flowing through this homogenizer. Now we can use here the concept of dynamic pressure. This is due, this pressure is developed due to the kinetic energy of the fluid flowing through a system. So here the dynamic pressure can be utilized, the concept can be utilized because the milk is flowing and it has some kinetic energy. So the dynamic pressure relates this the density and the velocity. So, the pressure is equals to half rho v square. Rho is the density of the fluid and v is the velocity. What do we want here is the velocity. The rest parameters we know. The density has been given, the pressure has been given which we can convert into the normal units, the SI units kg per meter per meter uh, per second, per se second square. So, here we will take v here that is the velocity. This will become uh, under root 2p upon rho. We will put the values of pressure 30 megapascal and the rho that is 1030 and we will solve this. This will come out something like this. We will take the under root and the velocity comes out to be 241.35 meter per second. So, this is the velocity at which the milk is flowing through this homogenizer. Looking at question number 70, it says potato slices have been dehydrated from an initial solid content of 12% to a final solid content of 94%. If the peeling and other losses are to the tune of 10%, the final yield in percent of the dried chips per ton of fresh potato taken is dash. So, the question is talking about the dehydrating potato to form potato chips. So, what the, what the process is like potato, we are slicing it, we are peeling it first and the peeling losses are being given that is 10% peeling losses. Then 
the it is being converted into slices and then it is dehydrated to form the chips let's imagine that we have 1 ton or let's say 100 kg of potato so including looking at this 10 percent peel losses how much potato will get to form the slices will be 90 so this is peel is 10 kg 90 kg will be left to form the final products now this 90 kg is again dried to give us dried product obviously the weight is going to be less than this 90 kg the question is saying that the slices have 12 percent of solid mass so the solid content of this 90 kg is 12 percent so the 12 percent of 90 will be 10.8 means out of this 90 kg 10.8 is your solid mass rest other is other things maybe water or other things and for dehydrated the solid content has increased up to 94 percent so obviously the water has been removed so the solid content will increase that is the percentage will increase the solid mass remains the same but the percentage will increase with respect to the new mass so let's imagine that the dehydrated chips has a weight of x kg now this has a weight of 90 kg now as i said the solid content is going to remain the same means this 10.8 kg will remain the same for both these things so 94 percent of this x will be 10.8 kg means the solid content in this dried chips will again be 10.8 kg so 94 percent of x will be 10.8 kg solving this to find out this weight of the dried chips 94 percent of what the total weight so the total weight we have to find out of the dried chips 94 into x is equal to 10 by simply solving this we can get this 11.489 that is approximately 11.49 kgs of your final dried product now they are asking per yield in the percentage obviously we have taken 100 so the simple it will be again 11.49 percent per ton of your potato chips so the final yield of the dried potato is 11.49 now let's look at question number 80 a mixed fruit beverage with 12 degree bricks having specific heat that is 4 to 9 8 joule per kg per kelvin is being heated from 30 degrees celsius to 95 degrees celsius for pasteurization at flow rate of 1000 liter per hour in a tubular heat exchanger steam at 100 degrees celsius converted into condensate at 100 degrees celsius if the density of the beverage is 1075 kg per meter cube and the latent heat of the steam is 2 to 57 kilojoule per kg the mass flow rate of the steam in kg per minute is dash so what the question is telling is that we have a tubular heat exchanger where we are using steam to heat to transfer the heat to the beverage that we are heating the increase in the temperature of the beverage is from 30 to 95 so let's look at the two parameters two two things that we have one beverage other is the steam so the beverage in this the heat transfer is taking place the volumetric flow rate is being given at which rate it, it is flowing 1000 liter per hour the density of the your liquid your the beverage is 1075 kg per meter cube and the specific heat is 4 to 98 joule per kg per kelvin we have to be very cautious with the units that we are handling with in such kind of questions so here it is volumetric rate what we have studied about the heat transfer is that q is equals to mc delta t that is q, q is equals to mass that heat transfer is equals to mass into specific heat into change in the temperature that will give you how much heat has been transferred to the product so here we have the mass flow rate or we can convert this into mass flow rate so heat flow rate will be mass flow rate cp delta t but we have volumetric flow rate so first we'll be converting this into mass flow rate into kg per hour unit so mass flow rate will be your so what is density mass upon volume so here we can find that mass flow rate can, can be written as volumetric flow rate into density both the values we have will put and multiply again the important thing to cancel out this units i have converted this liter into meter cube that is 1 liter is equal to 10 raised to the minus 3 meter cube i will put this value and multiply with the density what i have got my mass flow rate is 1075 kg per hour this is my mass flow rate now i have the cp that is the specific heat and i have the change in the temperature how much is change in the temperature 30 degree celsius to 95 degree celsius this is 65 degree celsius change but we have to write it in the kelvin so the but the difference will remain the same in the kelvin so again delta t will be 65 kelvin why am i using a kelvin so that it all remains in the same unit so now we'll put this in this equation q is equals to mc mcp delta t i have my mass flow rate i have my specific heat i have my change in temperature i'll put the values and i've got this as my heat transfer now what was the question telling that steam is being used to transfer the heat now steam is getting converted into condensate but the temperature is remaining same so what is involved here there the temperature was 
changing that is specific heat was involved here the temperature is not changing the state is changing of the steam steam it means the latent heat is involved here so instead of using your uh, cp and delta t there is no change in temperature we'll use just latent heat so heat transfer rate is equals to mass flow rate into latent heat latent heat value we have here but it's just in kilojoules so we'll convert it into joule later now q uh, we have to find out the mass flow rate of the steam this is this value how we'll find out we know these values we know the heat and we know the latent heat heat why it will remain the same because the heat transfer heat loss by one thing will be heat gained by the other so heat loss by the steam will be heat gained by the juice or the beverage so here the heat will remain the same i'll put the value of heat and divide it by the latent heat changing the units into joule i have got my mass flow rate as this kg per hour now the question was asking in kg per minute so i'll divide it by 60 and i have got my mass flow rate as 2.2 kg per minute so the answer is 2.2 kg per minute now we'll take up question number 19 room air is at 40 degrees celsius with 60 percent rh saturated vapor pressure of water at 40 degrees celsius is 7.375 kilopascal humid volume of air that is in meter cube per kg of the air is dash so in this the scenario is like we have a room where the temperature is 40 degrees celsius and the rh that is the relative humidity of the room is 60 percent the saturated vapor pressure of water at this temperature is the value has already been given 7.375 kilopascal this is the vapor pressure of the water saturated vapor pressure of the water at that temperature now what we have to find is humid volume of the air means how much volume of humidity is present in the air we will be taking the whole volume of the air so that is per meter cube per kg of air we have to find out this so let's take up this let's start with this relative humidity what is relative humidity it is actually the ratio of actual vapor pressure to the saturated vapor pressure of water so we have the value of already the relative humidity the room has 60 percent relative humidity and the actual vapor pressure we don't know but the saturated vapor pressure at that temperature is fixed and that is given here is 7.35 so we can put this value this is your actual vapor pressure and this is saturated vapor pressure we'll take this here and we'll we can get the actual vapor pressure in terms of kilopascal now for this question we'll be converting this to atmosphere to solve the further equations so now our uh, actual vapor pressure will divided by 101.3 to convert it into atmosphere now this this is our actual vapor pressure of this room that is 0 0.043 atmosphere now this is yet not the answer because we, we have just got the actual vapor pressure. What we want is the volume in meter cube per kg of the air. So for, then we'll be taking up the actual ideal situation, ideal gas situation, where we use the term humidity ratio. Now what is humidity ratio? Humidity ratio is how much amount of humidity is present per kg of air. So this is actually talking about the how much amount of water is present in the air. So that is water mass of the water upon mass of the air. In terms of vapor pressure, there is another formula already given 0.622 vapor pressure, actual vapor pressure minus atmospheric vapor pressure minus uh, divide by sorry, uh, actual vapor pressure divided by atmospheric vapor pressure minus actual vapor pressure. So we know our actual vapor pressure that is 0 0.043, the atmospheric vapor pressure here will be 1. So we'll put the values here, our actual vapor pressure we'll put here so that we can get this humidity ratio. So, from this value, we get 0 0.0279 kg per kg of water per kg of air. Means humidity ratio give, will give you in 1 kg of air, how much amount of water is present? This is 0 0.0729 kg of water is present in 1 kg of air in this room, in this particular room. Now, still we haven't got the answer because we don't want the amount of the water that is present. We want that how much volume of air, whole volume of humidity is present in 1 kg of air. That is the humid volume we have to find out. Humid volume is also expressed in terms of specific volume, which is actually talking about the volume of 1 kg, volume of dry air plus the your uh, water vapor. So, volume of dry air plus water vapor will give you the specific volume. Now, the specific volume has a particular uh, formula which has been derived by taking into consideration all the factors. Like at what temperature, what will be the what will be the volume, what will be the weight of that air and, and at particular temperature, what will be the weight of your water vapor. So, this is actual the formula. A little complicated one but we will be simplifying, simplifying it further. This is actually the weight of the volume of the air at, at 0 degree Celsius per 1 kg of mole. This is 29 is actually your weight of air at 1 kg mole air 
Now this T A is your actual temperature of the air of your room. Now zero has been taken the reference to zero. So Kelvin has been the temperature has been converted into Kelvin. This can be simplified to this equation. So the final for humid volume equation is this thing. Now you you would be having a little idea that this thing T A has come from this value solving this parameters. Twenty two point four is that volume. Twenty nine is actually the weight of the air and eighteen is the weight of our water. Now we'll be divided dividing this. Now how much air is there? One kg. How much water is there? Now how much water is there in our situation? We just found out. We found out that 0.0279 is the kg of water which is present in our air. So we'll put in water. So this is your air and this is your water. So we we are taking both the volumes here. We'll be solving this equation and we'll get this 0.924 meter cube per kg of air. You look at this equation. You will find out that this is what we wanted: meter cube per kg of air. So, what is actually the humid volume of this air is 0.924 is the answer. Now, let's move to the last question. Question number twenty: Freezing of 100 mm spherical mead ball with 60% moisture content is done at 35 degrees Celsius in blast freezer maintained at minus 45 degrees Celsius. The latent heat of fusion of water is 333.2 kilojoule per kg. The conductive heat transfer is 1.5 watt per meter per degree Celsius. Convective heat transfer coefficient is 40 watt per meter square per degree Celsius. The density of the frozen mead ball is 980 kg per meter cube, and the initial freezing temperature of the mead is minus 10 degree Celsius. So, using Planck's equation, we have to find out the freezing time in hours. Let's first understand what freezing time is. It is the time required to reduce the temperature of a food product from in, from its initial temperature to a desired temperature at its thermal center. Now, this freezing time is dependent on various factors such as what kind of freezer we are using, what is the temperature in the freezer, and if it is a kind of air blast freezer, what is the speed at which the air is flowing. Also, it depends upon the product properties such as what is the thickness of the product, what is the density of the product. Again, the shape of the product also matters, and other properties of the product. product also matters if there is any packaging or something else so to calculate the freezing time we have a very uh, direct equation that is called as the planck's equation the equation is such that the freezing temperature freezing time sorry freezing time is dependent upon these factors is equal to latent heat of the food into density of the food divided by the temperature difference between the product and the surrounding tf is the temperature of the food initial temperature of the food and ta is the freezing air temperature into pa upon h p here t and r here are both the constants which are dependent upon the geometry of the product what shape of the product is there so here what kind of product we are having a spherical meat ball so for spherical meat ball the value of p is 1.6 and r is 1.24 these are the constant values which depend on the shape of the product a is the dimension of the product so here the thickness is already been given that is 100 mm so we will convert it into meter that is 10 raised to the minus 1 meter a square h is the convective heat transfer coefficient the value is already given kf is the convective heat conductive heat transfer so as you can see we have this we have all the values it's just that the latent heat of water is given so we have to find the latent heat of the food so how much water is present in the food the question is has already told that it's 60% so we'll find it the moisture the latent heat of the food is moisture content into latent heat of water so moisture content is 0.6 into latent heat of water we'll get the latent heat of food the food product so this latent heat will be using in this formula to find out the freezing time let's put all the values in this formula so the freezing time comes out to be 1992 that is this the freezing the latent heat of the food into the density of the food that is 980 we will we'll keep the keep the units very carefully because we have to cancel out and find the time in hours so we'll put this then the temperature difference first initial temperature of the food product was minus 10 degrees celsius whereas the temperature of the freezing air is what minus 45 degrees celsius please be careful that this temperature of the product we have to take the initial freezing temperature of the product so the already the product initial freezing temperature was minus 10 degrees celsius so we'll keep here minus 10 minus minus 45 degrees celsius which will come out to be 35 degrees celsius so we'll directly put it here 35 degrees celsius now let's put the values of the p and r p here is 1 upon 6 so we'll put 1 upon 6 and r is 1 upon 24 so i have kept these values here a is our dimension that is the thickness of the product it is 
100 mm that is 10 raised to the minus 1 mm. So I will put here 10 raised to the minus 1 meter sorry and the square of this A will be here. Now this H is already given convective heat transfer coefficient, conductive heat transfer coefficient is already given. We will just directly put the values. Just be careful with the units. But here the unit seems fine. So that's why I've kept the same. Now by solving this, I'll get this value. Again, the units will be cancelled out here. So the kg will get cancelled out from kg. Okay, from here we'll get degree Celsius in this form because by adding this value we'll get degree Celsius upon 1 upon degree Celsius. That will come out to be degree Celsius. Then we'll get uh, minus uh, meter square minus Okay, we will get meter cube, sorry. So, meter cube will get out cancelled with meter cube and Celsius. The only thing which will be left is kilojoule and from here it will be watt. So, after calculating all this, we get freezing time as 38887.8471 into 10 raised to the minus 4 kilojoule per watt. Now, what is the question we have to find in obviously in the time units that is whether it's hour or seconds or minutes. So, we will convert first kilojoule or watt in the same units. Now we know that 1 watt is equals to 0 0.001 kilojoule per second that is 10 to minus 3 kilojoule per second. So I will convert this, I will put this value here so I will get something like this. So I will just divide it by 10 to minus 3, it will get cancelled out and I my value will be in seconds now. Now I have to convert it into hours because the question is asking by in hours so I will divide it by 3600 to convert it into hours. So, the value comes out to be 1.08 R. So, this is the final freezing time that is required to freeze this particular product. Thank you for watching this video. Please drop in the comment section the topics of food technology that you would like us to teach. Please share and like this video and subscribe to our channel, Foodemy.